Welcome, and thank you all for joining us this evening. I know we are competing with spring break and an unexpected Tar Heel win, which has taken us to a basketball game tonight. <laughs> so it's thank you all for coming. And I'm thrilled to host our special guest, Financial Times columnist and CNN analyst, Rana Farukhar. Tonight's talk is the kickoff event for a conference on the future of global capitalism that's hosted by UNC's Global Research Institute. In her new book, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World, Rana Faruhar writes this in the conclusion. We aren't going back to the golden era of neoliberalism and laissez-faire globalization. The events of the last decade from the 2008 financial crisis to the COVID-19 pandemic to the myriad challenges of climate change and its economic and political fallout have shown us that we must find a place in between in which a just-in-time world gives way to a just-in-case world. If the last 40 years were about unfettered commerce, economic efficiency, and no holds barred globalization, the next 40 years will be about bolstering community resilience and finding a new way to think about what economic success really means and how it should be measured. I can't imagine a better speaker to get us thinking about the many important issues wrapped up in the future of global capitalism, including how our food is produced, how we access medical care, how we make our clothes and build our houses, and make the goods we use. Baruchar does a deep dive into each of these topics in her new book, which I finished reading yesterday. <laughs> you know, as someone who spent 34 years as an American diplomat, and a chunk of that pursuing the free trade agreements that underpinned the soaring of the global trading goods from 1990 on, I've tended to see free trade as, on balance, a good thing a force that helped reduce global poverty from nearly 40% of the world's people in 1990 to less than 10% today, and a force that held down inflation by making manufactured goods available at a low cost. Back in the fall, we hosted in this very auditorium, the chairman and founder of the FedEx Corporation, Fred Smith. Fred advocated for the U.S. to reassert its leadership of a stable world order by re-engaging in global trade agreements. Quote, that system has been good for the U.S. and the world, maintaining peace and stability and creating economic opportunity, Fred Smith told us. Tonight, you'll hear a different take, that too much economic interdependence can be problematic and actually threaten U.S. prosperity. If you haven't gotten a copy of the book yet, Homecoming will be on sale again immediately after the talk. It's a wide ranging, thought provoking, important book. I'll be drawing on it and sharing it, its ideas with students and others. Reading this book has made me think very hard about well being in a post global world. Tonight's talk is part of our diplomatic discussion series, which brings speakers to campus to discuss topics like wither global capitalism and how much globalization is too much of a good thing, and the war in Ukraine, and the national security implications of climate change, to mention just a few of our recent discussions. Diplomatic discussions give Tar Heels direct access to experts and practitioners who are helping to define and address some of the world's greatest challenges. Diplomatic discussions are an integral part of UNC's Diplomacy Initiative. Through the Diplomacy Initiative, our students hear from diverse voices and perspectives. They learn to formulate questions, evaluate information sources, integrate multiple disciplines, and search for common ground on which to build a consensus about the way forward. They gain an understanding of the forces that shape our world and affect us right here at home. They learn to evaluate ideas and communicate clearly and persuasively. They learn skills, in short, that our guest this evening demonstrates in full measure in her career as a global economic analyst and reporter. Getting the chance to hear from a thinker as insightful and experienced as Rana Faruhar helps us all think critically about a topic like globalization by raising challenging questions 
Is the era of globalization really over? Who really benefited from globalization? What will it take to correct for the weaknesses of today's economy? Food insecurity, disrupted supply chains, income inequality. My colleague, Dr. Peter Koklanis, will formally introduce our speaker tonight. Peter is the Albert Ray Newsom Distinguished Professor in History and the head of the Global Research Institute, which organized this conference on the future of global capitalism. Peter is an economic historian who works on questions relating broadly to economic development in various parts of the world from the 17th century to the present. He's published widely on US economic history, Southeast Asian economic history, and global economic history. One of the great joys of my job is being able to explore ideas with Peter, who is as informed and insightful as he is kind and generous. Peter, thank you for inviting Rana to campus today. Let's welcome Peter Koklanis. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. That was uh, extremely gracious of you. Good evening, everyone. We're very pleased uh, that you were able to join us this evening. And uh, before going any further, let me thank uh, Ambassador Stevenson for uh, the warm welcome and for uh, the insightful opening remarks. I design tonight's talk by the distinguished economic and business journalist Rana Farrar was intended to punctuate conclude and punctuate a three-year Carolina seminar, a funded seminar that Arnie Kalleberg and I have been running on the future of capitalism. It's been called the perils and promise of capitalism in the 21st century. This seminar uh, was comprised of an interdisciplinary group of uh, scholars from Duke, UNC, and from RTP area more generally. The group met regularly between 2019 and 2022, often, alas, via Zoom. But uh, we met on themes, a wide range of themes relating to capitalism and its concomitants and its possible future. Among the topics that we discussed over this time were the many varieties of capitalism, state capitalism, democratic capitalism, authoritarian capitalism, and the like. We analyze shareholder and stakeholder conceptualizations of capitalism and approaches to capitalism. We analyzed as well the relationship between, uh, or at least association, between various forms of capitalism and public health, deaths of despair, and all that type of thing. We argued about globalization, past, present, and future. And we also looked at the relationship between the state of North Carolina and capitalism, often a very path dependent relationship that in some ways has uh, promoted our development, but alas, in other ways continues to hold us back. According to both the conveners, Arnie and myself and the participants, some of whom are here tonight, I think that the seminar was a success over the three years that it ran its course. Tomorrow and Saturday, uh, the seminar culminates, as Barbara pointed out, in a two-day conference in which 14 academics from around the world, uh, as well as local and, and from other parts of the United States, will be convening uh, to examine papers that we have all 14 of us have written and have been circulated in advance. We will argue about these papers, try to come up with some good criticism, and six months hence or so, we will ask for revised versions, which will then be published in a, uh, a uh, academic volume. Uh, Rana's talk tonight is the public expression, really, of what we hope to accomplish in uh, our workshop this weekend and really over the three years that we have been studying capitalism quite closely. Our speaker is already very well known to uh, all of you here tonight, so I will try to be brief and get out of the way. We're extremely proud and fortunate, I think it's fair to say, to host as our speaker the award-winning journalist, 
Rana Farur, uh, who is a journalist with not only the Financial Times, where she is business columnist and associate editor, but also economic analyst at CNN. As many of you know, she is a regular on Fareed Zakaria's GPS as well. Previously, she had long stints on, at uh, both Time and Newsweek, where she wrote on economic and business affairs, as well as foreign policy at times. She is a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations and, and is on the advisory board of the Open Markets Institute. Ms. Furar is an Indiana native, a father, an engineer, originally from Turkey, and her mother is a school teacher. She is a graduate of Barnard College of Columbia University, where she was an English literature major, which is refreshing. Uh, parenthetically, a number of years ago, we hosted Henry Paulson, who is US Secretary of the Treasury from 2006, 2009, and uh, Mr. Paulson was also an English literature major uh, from Dartmouth in his case. Uh, am I detecting a burgeoning trend? Perhaps, but alas, probably not. But it's interesting that two, two of these really eminent figures, one in journalism and one in, uh, in economic, in business journalism, the other uh, a very eminent figure in public policy, were both English literature majors. In any case, Ms. Furar is the author of three acclaimed books. Uh, we're focusing on her third tonight, but she has two other very good books as well, Makers and Takers, The Rise of Finance and The Fall of American Business, which came out in 2016. The very wickedly titled Don't Be Evil, The Case Against Big Tech in 2019. Many of you are probably familiar with the Don't Be Evil was Google's original motto. I don't think it is anymore. And then most recently, the book Homecoming, uh, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World, uh, which was published by Crown in October 2022. In her talk tonight, as we've seen, Ms. Furar will explore and elaborate on some of the main themes uh, addressed in this exciting new book, which is at once a call for and a forecast really of a much more calibrated type of globalization going forward. One which privileges and pushes and promotes deconcentration, localization, and a much greater emphasis, I think, on economic resiliency, rather than economic efficiency in and of itself. Uh, members of the audience, uh, Rana Furar, thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, what a gracious introduction. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Peter, Arnie, um, and thanks to everyone in the audience that's missing a basketball game uh, and beautiful weather and having me to this wonderful campus. Um, I spent my first hour here, I got in this afternoon and I walked around for an hour and then I called my husband and I said, I think we should retire in Chapel Hill. <laughs> so um, it's great to be here. And uh, it's really an honor to be here um, punctuating, as, as Peter said, this seminar and what sounds like an incredibly thoughtful look at capitalism and the issues facing this country and, and frankly facing the world right now, um, which is something I care deeply about and I know all of you do as well. Um, really pleased to be in North Carolina to discuss all this. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit about your state in particular, which actually figured largely in my book. I did a lot of reporting here. Um, when I'm asked to, to talk about the book, and I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes and then the ambassador and I will have some, some question time. When I'm asked to talk about the book, I'm often asked to give kind of a one-line summary. You know, what's the thesis here? And I often say the world is not flat. And that is a reference, uh, not to geography so much as to the Tom Friedman book, uh, which came out in 2005 of the same title. And Tom's book, and, and I love Tom, he's a friend, um, disagree with his view of the world a little bit, but his book really represented, um, I would say, the apex of a certain kind of globalization. And I would call that neoliberal globalization. Um, by that, I'm talking about the Washington consensus idea that capital, 
money, goods, and people, we're all going to travel seamlessly around the world and crucially land where it was most productive for them to do so. This was the world is flat idea that all boats were rising, people were going to be able to compete on an equal playing field globally. And, um, you know, really, uh, it was a very optimistic view of the world. Now, there is something to be said for this view, uh, because Tom's book was written in 2005, the period between 2008, or sorry, 2003 and 2007, right, right in between there, was the highest global growth in really in recorded history since these records have been kept. So a lot of wealth was created in the last half century as this neoliberal globalization was, was really the conventional um, way of doing policy. But there was a catch. I get into this a little bit in my first book, but really much more in this book. And the catch was that capital, money, finance always traveled much further and much faster than either goods and certainly than people. And that's one of the reasons that you have a global financial system, for starters, that is about three or four times the size of the real economy, depending on what day it is in the market. Um, and you get, you get a, a global system of capitalism, a market system that is kind of um, floating 35,000 feet in some ways above the concerns of the nation state. And that, to me, really punctuates, underscores a lot of the problems in our economy and in our politics today. So if you look at the stats over the last half century or so of neoliberal globalization, you can see that while there was this tremendous wealth created, there was also great inequality created really in most countries. It would be the exception, the countries where that was not the case. And within countries, there were certain areas that suffered more than others. I happen to, to have grown up in one of those areas um, in rural Indiana. Uh, my father was an engineer. He worked in the auto components um, circle that was sort of around Detroit. And we really saw the sharp end of the policy stick of the 80s and the 90s. We saw the consolidation of family farms. Um, a lot of people then went from agriculture into factories, those factory jobs by the 90s and the noughties were, were outsourced. And so I really saw, and it, it makes me teary sometimes even to say it, the, the, the destruction in some ways of the community that I grew up in. And, and it really, really changed um, in ways that we can maybe talk about more in question time. But this brings up something important, which is, and I really tried to get at it in my book, we talk about economics often in very dry terms, right? We talk about numbers and we talk about policies, but really economics is about people. And um, when I was thinking about writing this book, I had an interview uh, that was very, very important to me. It was with the former head of the AFL-CIO, uh, Richard Trumka. He passed away a few years ago, but lovely, lovely man. I used to talk to him a lot about policy and also kind of the felt experience of policy and how the rubber met the road in terms of what was being crafted in Washington and how it was really being felt by workers and individuals around, around the country and around the world. And so I went down to talk to him and I, I asked him, what were the conversations that you all were having um, in the 1990s around the time that NAFTA was being crafted and, and what were the discussions as China was coming into the WTO in 2001. And he said he remembered uh, a policymaker from the Clinton administration had come to talk to him. And he said to this individual, look, you know, some of these deals are really going to hurt us. And what's going to happen? What's the solution here? And the policymaker said, well, look, we know this is going to be hard for domestic labor, but don't worry. Uh, eventually, there's going to be a leveling out or a leveling up of wages. That's a term that's often used in economic circles. And again, goes to the world is flat, that wages are going to rise in developing countries and they're going to equalize and we're all going to be on an even playing field. And in the meantime, we're going to get a lot of cheap stuff. And, um, and, uh, and so Trumpka said, well, okay, but how long is that leveling out going to take? And the policymaker said three to five generations. And I remember putting my pen down and thinking, I must have heard him incorrectly. I said, did you say three to five years? <laughs> he said, no, three to five generations. And I just, I double checked, I triple checked that fact several times as I was writing the book, because I just couldn't believe 
what it said. And to me, it said a couple of things. It said first that there was a, a tremendous arrogance in the economics profession that thought that it could model the complexity of a world over three to five generations and plug all the inputs into an algorithm and come out with, hey, we're gonna send cheap capital to a cheap labor nation and get cheap stuff and everybody's gonna live happily ever after. And I just thought, wow, I'm gonna really start poking into economics and economic models more and, and think a little bit more about that because that this, this seems not right to me. Um, but the other thing that was really inherent in this view is that place didn't matter, that it didn't matter where jobs were being created as long as they were being created at a global level or even at a national level. And that's something I heard again and again while reporting the book. I actually had an interesting conversation with an aide to um, a senior democratic senator who was involved in a lot of these discussions. And, and he said, you know, even within the Democratic Party, which, um, you know, was associated more with labor, although that's, <laughs> that's now up for grabs, I think, at least in some circles. Um, he said that there was this sense that, look, we can just create jobs maybe in Brooklyn, um, you know, maybe in Chapel Hill, maybe in uh, San Francisco, and that people will come from the beleaguered areas to those places and they will leave their communities to do that. But what this theory didn't take into account is that when a community is hurting or when people are hurting, they're actually less mobile. They're less likely to leave because their community is what roots them. The family and the people around them, the churches, the institutions, these are the things that they turn to. And so mobility has actually decreased uh, in this country over the last couple of decades. And I think it has a lot to do with that um, economic fallacy, that, that neoliberal philosophy. And fortunately, we're, we're beginning to see the resurgence, um, or I should say the, um, the growth maybe, of a new place-based economics. And academics are really beginning to think more, much more about, well, what does growth look like in North Carolina versus Indiana versus New York? And it's, it's very, very different. So, where do we go from here? Well, we're not going back, as the ambassador said, um, quoting my book, we're not going back to the old world. And there's a few reasons for that. And I would say that all of the things that made the old world possible, um, three things in particular, cheap capital, cheap labor, and cheap energy, those are all going away. And so let me, let me walk through those points. When I say cheap capital, I'm referring to the fact that we've come through a 40-year period where money was pretty cheap. Right. So we've had, um, you know, for the last several decades, trend falling interest rates, you know, maybe they go up and down a little bit, but pretty much they've been going down. Um, recently, we've seen some rate hikes, but most of us, I mean, I'm 53, most of us have lived through a period in time where money was cheap and getting cheaper. And that allowed companies, um, big multinational companies, to borrow a lot and to use that money in many cases to pay back shareholders, to expand in, um, you know, in ways that were not about so much investing in the industrial commons, but were financialized, a little bit of a, a sort of a market shell game about raising stock prices. Um, easy to do that when you can borrow at 2% or less and then you know, use the money to, to do stock buybacks or pay dividends to the wealthiest shareholders. So that's going away now. Rates are going up. I think the Fed has made it pretty clear that they're going to keep fighting inflation and you know, we shouldn't look for, for things to go back to the, the mid-1990s anytime soon. Um, part of this neoliberal bargain was that that cheap capital went to cheap labor locations, namely Asia and particularly China. But even in China, the game is changing. And this is something I really want to draw home. When we think about deglobalization, and you know, I'm constantly on CNN trying to tell people it's not all about trade wars, and it's not even really about a particular administration. You know, you can go back and say, well, the Trump administration put tariffs on China, they started a trade war. Actually, before Trump was even in office, China came out with a plan called the Made in China 2025 plan. Uh, this was in 2015 that that came out. And it said, hey, our economy has changed. We've gotten richer. We're not the factory of the world anymore. We don't maybe want to be. We want to both produce and consume. We want to be a more regionalized economy. We want to own our own supply chains. That's going to help us move up the economic ladder. It's going to save energy. It's going to save carbon emissions. So Whatever you think of the Chinese regime, and I'm, I'm pretty hawkish at the moment myself, 
it makes economic sense. They were saying we are moving on from the cheap labor model. So that's point number two. And then point number three is that um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has just changed the global energy markets profoundly. And so this idea that you know, you're just going to get lots of cheap oil from an autocrat and that's going to be fine, <laughs> or cheap natural gas, I should say, from an autocrat, is really gone out the window. And I think that that has been a major, major wake up call for all of us, but for Europeans in particular, who have done really kind of an admirable job in, in trying to transition to clean energy very quickly. Um, now, you know, folks, folks like myself that have been covering the economy for decades, probably many people in this room have seen glimmerings of this old world and the changes that are that are coming down the pike. But I think that the pandemic was kind of like a scrim that was pulled up on this for the entire society. And it's been really interesting to see the public have discussions about supply chains. I mean, supply, like who talked about supply chains five or 10 years ago? That word is being used in the State of the Union address now, which is kind of crazy. Um, I love it as a wonk, but, um, uh, but you know, all you had to do in the pandemic was look around and say, okay, um, I'm locked down. Uh, restaurants are shut, but there's lines at grocery stores. Now, why would that be? That's a supply and demand um, mismatch. Well, because grocery stores and restaurants have two totally different supply chains, both highly concentrated, highly siloed. They don't talk to one another. That's not what efficient market theory would tell us should be happening. So head scratching. Um, other examples, and, and this is one that, you know, I think really hits home in, in, uh, in the Carolinas, the PPE shortage. So pandemic hits, suddenly we have a shortage of masks, as everyone remembers, maybe some of you, you know, like I did, uh, made homemade masks <laughs> with your churches or schools or community groups. Um, but why did we have that shortage? Well, because for the last several decades, um, essentially since China joined the WTO, the textile industry more or less left America. Now there's still some highly concentrated in the Carolinas uh, and that industry, which I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about later is almost a Darwinian case study in what survives when there is a huge economic hit and what survives are highly efficient, often private family owned businesses that are deeply rooted in a community. So that's what's left here. But basically masks were being bought from China, three cent masks. Now that's an interesting fact right there because that's dumping, that's trade, what's known as trade dumping because three cents won't even pay for the price of the cotton and the materials that go into a mask. So that becomes an interesting trade issue. But here we are, pandemic hits, three cent masks. China wants its masks back, understandably. So it's hoarding masks for its own people. And America's left to say, my gosh, why can't we make PPE anymore? And then something interesting happens, which is these community companies that are left, and many of them were in the Carolinas, and I followed several of them um, in, in during this period um, and, and looked at how they were rejiggering their supply chains. They said, all right, uh, nobody's buying t-shirts. Let's try and make masks again. And so they changed and they retooled and they communicated and they were really efficient. And within 18 months, not only did they make tens of millions of masks, but they drove the price of an American made mask down from 30 cents to 10 cents. Now that to me is just a really interesting story of what this country can still do when it decides it's really urgent and we need to make things. And that urgency to do more regionally, to create more resilience, to move from an efficiency model. And when I say efficiency, I'm talking about that neoliberal model of, okay, if I'm a, a CEO sitting in a corner office, what I wanna do is get costs off my balance sheet. I'm treating labor as a, a cost, not an asset. I'm gonna outsource to the cheapest place. That's efficient until something goes wrong, until there's a tsunami, until there's a pandemic, until there's a, an energy crisis. And then what you want is resiliency. And resiliency means redundancy. It means having more sourcing in more different places. It means doing more things locally. And I think that this is where we're headed for lots of reasons, not just political reasons, although you know that's certainly part of the story that you can see um, in areas like semiconductors, for example. And I just came literally yesterday, I was in Columbus, Ohio, 
giving a speech to the community there and Intel is moving in and starting a big, uh, a big foundry. So at the high end um, in strategic goods like semiconductors and lithium batteries, we're deciding as a nation, you know what? We need to make more stuff at home. We need to, and, and we need to make more things with partners. You know, if, if you look at what the neoliberal model brought us in, in semiconductors, which, you know, are really kind of the oil of the economy, they're in everything we need. Um, it took us to a place where 92% of all high-end semiconductor chips were made in Taiwan, one small, highly politically contentious island. That's not good for the US. It's not good for Europe. I don't even think it's good for China, actually. So, so we're moving to more localization and resiliency at the higher end. But even uh, with lower margin goods like textiles, like furniture, I think we're going to see more localism, more regionalism for a couple of reasons. Go way back 10, 10 years, 20 years. Even then, I was hearing from CEOs that were saying to me, you know, we're starting to rethink whether it really makes sense to tote lower margin goods thousands of miles through the South China Seas where it's becoming a, a hot zone. We're a little worried about security. Um, maybe it makes more sense to make these things at home. And so that, that wage uh, energy transport arbitrage was changing and it's changing even more now. At the same time, you have entirely new technologies in um, a, an area called additive manufacturing, 3D printing, you know, you might, you might know it as. This idea that, you know, I can now make this bottle right here in just a few minutes with the right kind of machinery. Or as I discovered um, a few weeks ago, I was in Long Island uh, outside New York where there's a big housing crisis. And I watched a 3D printed home going up in six days. Um, giant 3D printer about this size, but basically just like what you would print with paper, um, you know, different equipment, but the same idea. These technologies are just starting. And I think that we're gonna be in the next decade or so in a period of transformation where all the things that came, say, in 2007 came to your phone, those things are now coming into industry, and we are going to see all kinds of innovation. I know some of it is happening, you know, right here uh, nearby in, in, um, in the triangle, but in many industries in ways that we can't even begin to imagine, there's going to be disruption, and it's going to allow us to do more on site, and it's going to change entire uh, local and regional economies, I believe. And then, you have the climate change issue. Um, and that's that's something that I think is gonna continue to put a tailwind onto this trend of localization and regionalization. Basically, once you start putting a price on carbon and, and once you start putting a real price on labor, once you start kind of thinking about how do we wanna treat workers? How do we wanna treat the planet? Then that $5 t-shirt, cheap, maybe it's not so cheap. Maybe, maybe we need to think about cheap in a different way. Maybe we need to think about, is that t-shirt really worth the hollowing out of the industrial commons, the job loss, the environmental degradation? And as those ideas are actually codified in law, as they are becoming right now through things like the Inflation Reduction Act, I think you're going to see a lot more being done locally. Now, this is part of a larger shift, and I know it's something that Peter and, and Arnie have talked about um, in the seminar, this stakeholder capitalism shift. So we are moving from this world in which share prices and consumer prices were the only metric of success, right? So for the last half century or so, as long as share prices were going up and consumer prices were going down, nobody thought there was a problem in the economy. But there are negative externalities, as we've been talking about, and now we're thinking about what's good for workers, what's good for the community, what's good for the environment. And the Biden administration actually put out um, what I think is a pretty profound executive order on all of this uh, in, in 2021. And I think it's gonna be remembered in a similar way to the Milton Friedman speech, in the, or sorry, the Milton Friedman piece in the New York Times in the 1970s, where he said, you know, shareholder capitalism is the thing. Biden basically said, you know what? No, we've moved beyond shareholder. We are moving into a world in which we need more diversity. We want to uh, have support for small businesses, for citizens, not just consumers. We're going to define what prosperity really means. And to me, and I, I'll, I'll end with this, and, and, and then we can start on um, the discussion. 
I think that actually takes us back to an older and healthier form of capitalism. So if I, if I look at what Adam Smith, uh, the father of modern capitalism, said we needed for a healthy economy, he would have said we needed three things to make markets really function well. We needed equal access to information on both sides of a transaction. We needed a shared understanding of what was being bought and sold. You know, what are the conditions of this transaction? How is this good being made? This, this, is, this is a time when you were doing business in a marketplace where you could really see and understand these things. And the third factor he said we needed was a shared moral framework. And I would argue that over the last couple of decades in particular, we've been dealing in markets in which none of those things have been true. And I think to the extent that we are now having this dialogue, we're raising the curtain on those challenges and questions, that's a great thing. And it's gonna get us back to a place where we have the right narrative and we can make the right decisions to create a kind of a capitalism that is good for everyone. So with that, I'll stop and we can have some questions. Terrific, um, terrific. Well, that was wonderful. That was uh, just a refreshing and really clear summary of, of what is uh, what's in the book. So what we're going to do is I'll do a fireside chat. I've prepared a few questions because I've read the book. So I'm going to go into those. But let me get a quick look now. How many of you have got a question that you want to ask Rana Farukar? Maybe. Okay. I just want to gauge how much time I need to leave for the um, for the Q and A um, component. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with some of the questions for a fireside chat, and then we'll have an opportunity for you to, to to ask your questions. So, one of the big ideas in your book, Rana, is um, you talk about in your chapter exorbitant privilege, exorbitant burden. It's a quote from a former French president Valéry Giscard d'Estaing when he was the finance minister of France, that having the dollar as the reserve currency was this exorbitant privilege. But you point out it's an exorbitant burden as well. And I wondered if you would walk us through how having the dollar as a reserve currency has really contributed to the hollowing out of America's industrial base. Um, it's such a great question to start. Oh, you know what? Let me turn on my, see if I can find my. There we go. Okay, I think I'm, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. No. Uh, you got a green light going, so let's see. Light. So maybe that, well, I'll just, um, oh, there we now go. Now it's coming. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's a great question to start, and it's so complex, but it's so core to these topics. So, um, let me go back and, and do a little history. And this is actually more from my first book, but, but I think it kind of gets at, at how we got here. So um, we had a certain kind of capitalism, let's say from the post-war period until about the late 1970s. And I don't wanna be um, you know, too idealistic, but it was a little bit more of a, it's a wonderful life kind of you know, community-based um, capitalism where you had a, I would say a better balance, and this is statistically true, between consumption and production. You had a, an economy that was based a little bit more on income growth uh, and less on asset prices going up. If we think about how our economy works today, a lot of us that are lucky enough to own a home or to have some stocks, that's kind of what where our wealth comes from, by and large. You're not, you know, you're not getting 20% hikes in your in your pay very often, but you might be seeing an uptick in your assets. That's very different from the economy we had um, in, uh, up until the late 1970s. Now, at that point, the country was going through um, some financial pressures, and there was inflation, and there had been a kind of a, you know, what, what's known as the guns and butter debate about um, the social programs that came from the, the 60s, the Vietnam War. And so politicians, really, frankly, of both stripes, were saying, um, all right, we have to make some tough choices here between interest groups. And you know, we don't really wanna make those choices. Um, and so in markets were deregulated, interest rates were de deregulated. And I would say that that was the beginning and Peter might, might have thoughts on this and know better than me even, but that was the beginning of 
a kind of a tossing the ball to the financial markets and to the Federal Reserve in particular. Um, and as interest rates were allowed to move um, more freely in the US, that saw that basically allowed for an influx of foreign capital. And we started seeing a lot of money from overseas coming into the US. Now that allowed for a lot of room for America to uh, run debts and deficits, um, to do a lot of financial innovation. Um, the dollar being the global reserve, which it really has been since the post-war period, but, but really that financialization that took off in the 1980s, um, it created a different kind of economy. Uh, the dollar got stronger, um, but our goods that we were producing got more expensive. And it's interesting because the business lobby in the 1980s was actually very worried about this. The business roundtable put out a letter. Um, I, I can't remember what year it was, but it was in the 1980s. And they said, you know, we're kind of concerned about the fact that the dollar is so strong. And this is, you know, um, making it hard to sell, sell U.S. products. But policymakers basically on both sides of the aisle said, you know what, that's kind of fine. And I'm, I'm glossing over and, and, um, and giving you the, the big picture view. But they said the economy is kind of like a pyramid. And you know, we went over the last century from an agrarian society to a manufacturing society. We're now going to a service society. We're all going to be bankers and software developers. And so the dollar is strong. That's great. It's going to make our assets um, more highly valued. We're all going to get very wealthy. Let China make the shoes, the shoes and the light fixtures. But <laughs> that creates imbalances, right? It just does. And it kind of goes back to worries that the founders of the Bretton Woods system, even you know the econ uh, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, said you know he was worried that if we had a single global reserve, the dollar, that we were going to end up in a situation like this where you had a global economy that was very lopsided, and you know one country would be doing all the spending and another all the savings. He actually wanted to have something called a bankor, which was a sort of a basket currency. Um, and in some ways, I think we may be heading not quite to that world, but certainly to a more multipolar currency world as part of the changes we've been talking about. And you also talk about digital currencies yeah. as being one of those others that weakens the grip of the dollar as the reserve currency. I wanna bring this down to a concrete example and you cite it in the book, Germany and Japan, but Germany has retained a healthy manufacturing sector while the US and the UK economies have taken on the shape of a barbell, your book says, with high paying service jobs at the top and low paying service jobs at the bottom and a very thin middle because there's no production of goods. So how do you explain the different outcomes? The impact of the dollar as a reserve currency is of course part of what America's story is, but it's not really the UK's story. And of course, Germany was subject to the same global forces as yes. the US and the UK. So how big a role does the dollar as reserve currency play? And how big a role do you think financial deregulation in the US and UK plays? That's interesting. Um, well, let me speak to the German example uh -huh. um, a, a little bit because <clears throat> I think that the comparison is sort of interesting when we try and understand <laughs> what's happening in the US. So Germany benefited greatly from being part of the Eurozone. Um, Germany in some ways is like the China of Europe because it, it has uh, you know, a lot of trading partners that are on the periphery, but it gets to buy and sell in the Euro as opposed to the Deutschmark, which would be way high and make German exports much more expensive than say another country like Italy, which is very good in manufacturing um, and would be a lot cheaper and more competitive if it was Lira v. Deutschmark. So, so that's an interesting thing to think about. But the other thing that Germany did, um, which was different than what America did, which was to think about becoming just a service sector and a kind of a very highly financialized service sector, they always thought manufacturing was important. They never let go of manufacturing. The percentages, again, I I'm, I'm, might be slightly off, but I think it's around, it's somewhere between, uh, I want to say it's about 16% manufacturing um, still in, in Germany, and it's, it's far lower in the U.S., um, now, why would that be? Well, for starters, um, a lot of the German manufacturing companies are kind of like those Carolina textile firms that I mentioned that have survived. They're multi-generational, family-owned, private 
um, very community-based firms, and they tend to be sort of world beaters in one or two things. Like, you know, in Stuttgart, which is their big manufacturing base, you'll find the laser company that makes the best lasers, one kind of laser for, you know, for the last 40 years. They, that, that's, that's what they're into. And they also have something in their own um, economic paradigm called co-determination, which is a kind of a better, better, more uh, collaborative labor model, I would say, than the, the labor model, the labor union model that we have in the U.S. In co-determination, you have labor representatives as well as members sometimes of the public sector and civic society sitting on corporate boards. So good example, um, in 20, uh, well, great financial crisis happens in, in 2008. Everybody falls off a cliff, cliff for a while. In the U.S., the response is a lot of people get fired just immediately. We lay people off because that's how we do things. It's boom bust, uh, boom bust. In Germany, the government and the regional communities say, okay, we're going to furlough. We're going to put people on two thirds time. Uh, and then we're going to use that, that low end, that sort of, you know, lower um, demand period to upgrade factories uh, or to retrain workers. Um, everybody shares a little bit of the pain, you know, the companies might get public tax credits, labor would take a cut, um, you know, the public sector would, would chip in. And what that meant was that when the global economy started to recover, so when China started to recover, particularly in 2010, Germans could move in quickly and grab a lot of market share from the U.S., um, so again, cheap isn't always cheap. We think we have this great system because we can be so flexible because we don't have the social safety net, but it doesn't always work the way we think it does. That didn't answer your question about deregulation, but um, I can come to that now. I mean, to me, the, 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 the way in which the hollowing out of the industrial commons intersects with financial deregulation is as we move from the 80s onward to um, a more and more highly financialized market-driven economy, you get a kind of a short-term quarterly capitalism that is driven very much by Wall Street, where a company, particularly a, co a public company, you can't go to the market today and say, you know, we're not going to give back any dividend payments this this quarter or maybe for the, not even for the next year or five years because we're going to invest in this awesome new technology that's going to pay off in 10 years. I've got several examples in my first book. Every time a company does that, their stock price tanks. You know, when, when Apple said it was going to invest in the iPhone, their stock price went down. When Microsoft invests in a new technology, its stock price. Now, when they say, hey, we're going to do share buybacks and we're going to give back our free cash, stock price goes up. So it just starts to put the incentives, um, it misaligns the incentives, particularly in a world in which our greatest global competitors are state-run capitalist countries that are looking for the 50 years, not for the quarter. Which leads us beautifully to your trip to North Carolina, where you toured um, Cotton Field yeah. with Bayard Winthrop, who is the CEO of American Giant. And you do a little, you know, ode to the family owned business, which is shielded from these forces in yeah. some ways. Will you talk about that? And then yeah, talk about why this is a winner in the Darwinian. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, it, it, this, this topic is um, very much on my mind right now because the kinds of businesses that I will describe and, and, and Bayard's supply chain represents them. There are actually a lot of these businesses in America. They're kind of hidden gems. Um, you know, I grew up in rural Indiana. There are still, I mean, my, my dad ran a small manufacturing company that private operated in the same way for the longer term, investing a lot into technology, um, you know, not thinking about quarterly capitalism. They're all over the country and, and we still do this kind of business. But, uh, and I'll, I'll say one thing and then I'll go back to Bayard. I'm worried because private equity companies have actually figured this out. They figured out that there are a lot of these uh, little hidden gems around the country in industrial manufacturing right now. And because that sector is hot, it's actually going to be an area where you're probably going to see some consolidation and some, some robber barons coming in and trying to do a lot of, you know, wrap ups and buyouts. So that's something I'm watching carefully. And I'm actually lobbying that we should have some rules, particularly in um, areas that are 
um, strategic around uh, you know, the financialization of these companies. But to go to your question about Bayard, what is so cool is you go into these companies and I visited, um, I went all throughout his supply chain. I started literally in the cotton field um, in, uh, I believe it was outside Enfield where, where they uh, grow the cotton and gin it. And here's an interesting technological development. Um, as governments, not just the US, but other governments are starting to really put some, some carrots and sticks into legislation saying, we wanna know how companies, um, you know, what, what's the carbon footprint of their supply chain, how they treat their labor. There's now sensor technology uh, where when you wrap a bale of cotton uh, on the machine, you can tell not just the, the county, but the, the field, the, you know, the size of this rug, you can tell where that cotton is from. So that's kind of really a cool game changer. And it's, it's interesting because he's actually, Bayard, who uh, runs American Giant, is actually starting to think about, is there a way that you could even use this from a marketing and promotional standpoint that like you could get really local, not just buy your Tar Heel sweat, you know, sweatshirt, but you buy the Tar Heel sweatshirt from this particular field, you know, that you can, you can say that's where it came from. Anyway, you can take that and iterate it. Um, but you go then to the, the, the family-owned gins, um, the companies that are doing the cutting and the sewing, and it's incredible the amount of money that they put back into R&D and technology, 80% sometimes of, of profits, which is unheard of. I mean, it used to be not so uncommon in America for 10 or 20% to be put back in profits. Today, you'd be lucky even at a tech company to see three to 5% put back. So that's, that's like a whole different way of, of running business. And these folks can do it because again, they're private, they're often shielded from pressure, or if they're public in the case of Parkdale, for example, which is a pretty big multinational, which is also in their supply chain, it's family owned. And it has a patriarch that is saying, look, we are simply not going to change how we're doing business. Um, so, so that's really different. And another thing that I think is so cool about these companies is because they've been under so much pressure globally and they're all in the same community and they kind of all know each other, they do a lot of competition collaboration. So I remember talking to one of the, um, the suppliers who got a big contract from major league baseball and couldn't, couldn't just couldn't do it all on his own quickly enough. And so he calls up a bunch of, you know, folks that maybe he would be competing for other bids with and say, will you come in with me on this? And so again, that's a, a it's a more Germanic way, or maybe it's just an earlier American way of doing business. Even with all that, and I love the, how much a family owned business that's not subject to these financial pressures can, how agile it can be. But even with those advantages, are these tech stock companies in a position to compete in a globalized economy? And if not, what do they need? It's a good question. I believe that they are. And I think, you know, that, that example I gave of how quickly, if you're iterating uh, and you're innovating that you can drive price down. And if you start to get a full understanding of a price, you know, if you tally in the carbon load, if you tally in the energy costs, if you tally in the labor standards, I think you get pretty quickly to a place where a 10 cent US mask and maybe a six cent Chinese mask are not so different. And you could, you could envision, and I would hope the federal government would say, you know what, let's put a floor under this market. Let's say we're going to for indefinitely um, by 25%, not just of our PPE, but of our upholstery for the electric vehicles of the you know, wind turbine covers that these companies might also be able to make if they were connected to other industries in the region that are being subsidized for strate strategic reasons. I don't think it's all that hard to get to that place. Um, now, what would they need? They need some clear accounting and that's something that's happening right now um, there's a lot of work going on and I've interviewed some fascinating companies that are mapping supply chains. So um, a friend of mine, David Barboza, who worked at the New York Times for many years and he won the Pulitzer Prize in 2012 for um, mapping Chinese uh, companies and connecting the wealth of the, um, the premier at the time, Wen Jiabao and some of the top party members to top companies. He's taken that work and actually spun it out into a business. 
where he has now tracked the supply chains of 10 million companies doing business in China. We're going to have to start doing that in the US. We're going to have to start doing that in Europe. And when you start tracking the supply chain, it's quite fascinating because it's almost, again, like a, the curtain gets pulled up on, oh, this is what's been happening in the last 40 years of capitalism. And David tells me, for example, that it's not uncommon when he looks at his matrix to find all kinds of interesting things like um, a Texas-based company that might be have a Defense Department contract, but also have an affiliate who happens to do uh, business with the PLA and have a division in the British Virgin Islands. I mean, it's like, you know, you start to see like, wow, these big multinational companies in the long, complex supply chains, those companies are going to be under a lot of pressure. The companies that have simpler, local or more transparent supply chains, I think are going to be in a very good position, particularly those that can capitalize on um, additive manufacturing and high tech. You have a great chapter in the book called Why Making Things Matter, uh, Why Making Things Matters. And we've thought, as the book um, explains, you know, that it's about jobs, right? What we lost was manufacturing jobs. But manufacturing doesn't involve that many people anymore. It's not the jobs, you say. Um, the biggest impact, you say, lies in the fact that the industry enables innovation to occur in an entirely different field. If you can't innovate, you can't really succeed in the 21st century economy. I want you to talk about why you need to make things to innovate. Um, such a great question. Well, you know, to me, this is one of those things that was always in my felt experience. You know, I grew up on factory floors and I just saw my dad working, you know, I saw things being made. It was just kind of almost in my DNA that that's how you do things. That's how you learn to do things. And that's how you do things better and better and better. And there's now a body of research that is showing that indeed this is exactly the case. In fact, this is how Taiwan came to make 92% of high-end chips they iterated. US went what's called fabless, which meant that we were gonna do only the software, only the, 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 the sort of the virtual pieces, the high-end research. And all right, that keeps a certain amount of value in place, but in order to have, um, to go up the food chain fast and create large amounts of jobs, you actually do need to make things. I think we're also at a real pivot point as we move into the industry, uh, sorry, the, the internet of things, um, this sort of new industrial revolution in which sensor technology, big data are gonna kind of bring an intelligence into industry and into the supply chain. Um, that's gonna really mean that you're gonna need to connect software, hardware, um, you know, head, heart, and hand, hand work. That's a, a phrase that I'm borrowing from David Goodhart, who's a, um, a British author. But this, this idea that you need to have the robotic technician that understands the machinery and the software. You need to have someone who's on your factory line um, helping to surface information at the same time that you have a PhD designing software and culling big data, all that stuff is needed to move up the food chain. If you haven't read Chip War by Chris Miller, oh that's the gosh, other yes. book I'm plugging. It yes. just absolutely demonstrates how what happens on the floor is how they're figuring out. I'm things. doing, just in case anybody's interested, the um, Financial Times has a weekend conference in Washington at the end of May, and it's, it's virtual as well. And I'm doing conversation with Chip. Are with, you? Um, yes, Chris. Chris, sorry. <laughs> Chip Wars by, by Chris, uh, Chris Miller. Chris Miller, that's right. Well, we'll have to push that out to everybody to watch. It's great. I want to turn to big food for a bit because you've got a chapter on that and then a couple more that really kind of go into this. And you say that neoliberal thinking led to agricultural policies in the U.S. that favored efficient production of calories. And that's resulted in, here we are, quote, loss of biodiversity, extensive habitat losses, increases in dietary health problems, pollution, and climate change. Farmers continue to be paid to grow cash crops like corn, soybeans, and wheat in big quantities, but they're disincentivized from growing fruits and vegetables. So I want you to talk about that. And then, of course, the Farm Bill is up for renewal this year. One of our <laughs> students and the Washington semester is working on it in the House Ag Committee, so we get a chance to talk about that. 
Can you talk about the role of subsidies and now subsidized insurances for crops in distorting agricultural production in the U.S.? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so agriculture, you know, like so many areas, education um, hasn't really been reinvented in America in quite some time. So our whole system of agriculture and what we subsidize actually goes back really to the Great Depression and um, to uh, the need to, um, to feed a lot of workers that were part of kind of the end, tail end of the Industrial Revolution with, um, and to employ farmers, you know, at, at this time of, of struggle. And so we subsidized farmers rightly at that time to grow a lot of cash crops so that we could give people more calories cheaply. That was what was needed at the moment. But, you know, over the last few decades, as you know, we all kind of know, we all have plenty of calories. In fact, the country produces, I think, um, quadruple the number of calories that we need. Um, and sadly, we're eating, I, I'm often eating too many of them myself. Um, but we don't produce the right kinds of things. So we're, uh, we can only produce even with all of California's bounty and California is one of the top three um, fruits and vegetable growing regions in the world. Even with all that bounty, we're only producing um, somewhere between 20 and 30% of the healthy calories that we need. So we actually import a lot of fruits and vegetables. Now add to that climate change. Um, and the fact that the growing seasons are changing, um, we're getting, you know, uh, uh, just in terms of what we can grow and where, um, you know, you look at what's happening in, in California just on a seasonal basis and you see there's a lot of disruption. So we're starting to think, and this is what got me interested in writing about agriculture, we're starting to think of, gosh, we need to change our entire paradigm. Um, maybe we shouldn't be subsidizing uh, the growing of corn and soybeans, and maybe we shouldn't be overproducing to an extent that farmers, you know, really can't make a profit and end up, no matter how productive they are, throwing away vast quantities of food and also being involved in this strange, highly financialized system with lots of middlemen. So it, it, when I was looking at the problems in the old line agricultural industry, one of the places I went to was Missouri. And I spoke to a pig farmer there who um, he'd uh, been a, a farmer for many generations and was complaining that he could not take his pork literally six miles down the road and sell it to a school at a price that would be beneficial for both of them because he had to go through commodities traders in Chicago and giant food distributors that had locked up the whole supply chain. So the subsidization of big and the concentration that that has led to has just so skewed the community. Now in that same community, I spoke to a woman um, who uh, had set up a, a, a family cooperative to grow a variety of crops, um, you know, dif different fruits and vegetables as well as some cash crops. And she actually ended up during the pandemic plugging some of the need for food in that community. She created kind of a food bank and, and let people come and, and access that because it could be grown locally and resilient, resiliently. And this is something that a lot of people um, in many walks of life in the Defense Department, in national security, in the financial community are saying, we need a lot more localization and we need a lot more diversity in food because this is, this is a huge national security issue. You know, you think about how siloed the food production supply is. Think about what it would take to just take out California production and what that would mean, or to knock out, you know, three or four of the big um, poultry poultry producers. You need diversity, and that's better for the community. It's better for the environment. I also got in that chapter to some of the high tech techniques that are being looked at to uh, create diversity. So vertical farming is a really cool thing. Um, Google Campus. You go um, as I have many times, and you see they've got thousands of people there, they are all fed from the fruits and vegetables grown literally up the walls. I mean, in a building like this, you might see produce growing on the walls and no chemicals involved. It's all about highly targeted concentrations of light and water. So there's just all kinds of cool things happening in this space. I'm gonna pause there and take some questions from the audience. I think you had a question. Do you wanna go ahead? Um, hang on, Kristen's going to bring you a mic. He's right there on this side. 
There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, which um, I, I very much appreciate it. And, and I agree with your vision, uh, and I think it's the right one. But I think it also implies a certain politics. Mm. Uh, and you see, I'm a refugee from a small, intolerant state known as Florida. <laughs> and when I look back home, I think there's a possibility that the politics that is uh, necessary and maybe even uh, happening for, for this to come about may not be here in two years. And so how do, how do we handle that issue? Um, so great question. And I am here to give you a little bit of optimism and actually from Florida, believe it or not. Um, so I, I am a registered Democrat, but um, I have a friend, um, Robert Hockett, who is a Cornell um, economist, and he is a policy advisor. He was actually Bernie Sanders chief policy advisor, but he is advising Marco Rubio of all people right now. And um, he, Rubio and Ro Khanna, who is a California Democrat, have co-sponsored a bill together um, to require all cabinet level agencies to map their supply chains. Now, the way Hockett, who is very, very clever as a policymaker, was able to sell this was, you know, on the left, there's kind of obvious reasons you want some industrial strategy. The left is more comfortable with government, um, you know, looking at things like supply chains and trying to work out market efficiencies in some cases, although not the Clintonian left, but that's another talk um, <laughs> or maybe a talk for Peter. Uh, and uh, but but the way he sold it to Rubio, who used to chair the small business committee, um, was, hey, think of all the efficiencies that we're going to find when we map the supply chains for, for you know, even 10 different federal agencies. We're going to see 13 different lending programs that could be combined. You're going to, I mean, I, I'm the ambassador, I'm sure, could tell us more about this. Um, <laughs> And so I say this just as a small example to say that I actually see some interesting common ground here. And, and I could add national security to that, of course. Um, so I'm more hopeful. Now, I, I, what the thing that does worry me is I think the China issue is going to have to be very carefully messaged and spoken about. I worry sometimes when I'm in policy talks that we get to a a China bashing place too easily. And I, I don't want to be in that place. I want to be in a, hey, China, good for you for bringing 800 million people out of poverty and for taking a page out of the Hamiltonian industrial policy playbook. You know, maybe we should do that um, and get our own ideas back. Great. Who else has a question? We've got a question here and one back up here. Let's go here first, Chris. Thanks. I love what you had to say about resilience, and I think it's a, a really great keyword for thinking about the market economy. But I, I worry that the real problems with capitalism have to do with a different word, sustainability, with the, the, the link between the market and the non-market sphere, mm. not just the natural environment, but also the social environment, which is being really di disrupted and degraded and some pretty significant ways. So I'd really love to hear more about your thoughts about kind of the sustainability part. Mm -hmm. I, I do think it has, uh, it doesn't fit as neatly into the making of things as yep. a solution. Yep. Uh, and it, I think it, it points in a slightly different direction. So maybe you could say more about that. So I'm I'm thinking if I have your question right that you're thinking a little bit about the care economy about about labor as a sort of a resource and an asset how to um, value human beings and work is that sort of where you're I guess I'm trying to say I think there's a parallel between concerns about global warming and climate change yeah. and changes in the social climate that are also kind of an externality or an offshoot of the processes of Huh. of development that we're talking about. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I, your, your question is really interesting and nuanced. And um, if, I'm, if I'm getting you right, I mean, there's a kind of a despair that's set in or a kind of a polarization that has set in in the country, I think. Um, uh, Peter mentioned deaths of despair, I guess, that you've, you've 
looked at the Angus um, Deaton and Ann Case work, which is interesting. And, and I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, I am struck, I'll just be a little anecdotal here. I'm struck by my, I have a 20 year old daughter who is at the University of Chicago. She's had every advantage, you know, she and her cohort are there. I won't say despondent would be too strong, but there is a sense of well, the world's going to hell in the handbasket. And, you know, gosh, it's just that that worries me. I and I worry about cynicism as well. Cynicism in politics. As a matter of fact, I'm worried. I'm keeping my fingers crossed because we're about to do this huge money dump into things like chips and into the Inflation Reduction Act. And Gina Raimondo, the Commerce Secretary, recently put out a wonderful speech saying, you know, priority number one is transparency and good governance, because if we do this and people have a sense that this has been wasted money or there's corruption or, you know, it's we're never going to get to do it again. That's it. And I think that is what you're what you're getting at. Um, it's I guess, you know, one could have a it's an, a totally understandable, pessimistic view, but. I guess I don't know. I've tried to I've tried to lay out, and I do believe that there there is a moment for optimism because I guess I feel like for the first time we we're getting the narrative right. You know, I wrote a book after the financial crisis, and I don't think we had the narrative right then. It was a very technocratic narrative. It was oh, we just need to do X, Y, and Z to banks. We need to get this tier one capital. We need, and it was just like no, we need to rethink what kind of society we want to live in. And that debate, I think, is what we're having now. So I'm sorry, I'm going to try and end on a positive note. <laughs> I, we're going to take, um, do, do we have a hand back here? Let's thank you, and then we'll come to you. Hello, uh, I'm a student here, economics. Uh, I just wrote down one question and I'm trying to understand uh, your rationale. Um, is it that you don't agree with the efficient market hypothesis or is it that you think that there are all these uh, numerous like non-financial externalities that are ultimately reducing utility? I, I'm really glad you asked that question. It's a smart question. Um, listen, there's certainly a lot to be said for the efficient market hypothesis, but I don't think it's perfect. And I think we got to a place where the assumption was that markets were perfect and maybe more importantly, that all externalities could be modeled. Um, I tend to, one of my kind of intellectual rabbis is, is uh, Joe Stiglitz, the um, economist. And I remember he said something, we're both from Indiana, and he said something to me once that just stuck in my head because I, I asked him, I said, He's been banging this gong since the 60s. And I said, how did you come to this understanding that markets were not perfectly efficient? You know, that's what he won the Nobel for. And he's like, well, I grew up in Gary. All I had to do was look around and see that they weren't efficient. <laughs> so I guess what I would like is if the, the Chicago school folks and the people who are more mathematically driven and have a little bit of physics envy, perhaps, you know, would be talking as they seem to be in places like this more to, um, although not in all institutions, to, to the behavioral economists and the sociologists and the anthropologists and the journalists, because I think we need both inductive and deductive reasoning at the moment to solve, solve the challenges. That's a great answer. And you've got a question. We'll make this, I think, our last one. I don't see any other hands up. I was a middle school student in the very early uh, 60s. I was a uh, middle school student in the very early 60s, and I remember very clearly that our social studies classes taught, um, and this was uh, repeated, and it seemed, and it, and it stayed with me as I, I grew older, that corporations need to be good corporate citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, is that even being taught anymore? Uh, and And... No, I, well, I mean, we're we're at the we're at a pendulum shift, and the answer is no. I mean, that changed. It changed because basically, um, the uh, the business roundtable, which is the largest business group, after um, I forget, I think it was in the late 1980s, they kind of issued a statement saying, 
really share shareholder value is is our is our metric. Um, and I think from that time on, it's been about the money culture, and it's been about the, and I, you know I can't, there's a there's a larger anthropological and cultural thing that I think you're pointing at. I remember um, growing up in the '80s, my mom, who was a school teacher, got started getting Money Magazine. And, you know, there was, the, there was all those publications, Money Magazine, Smart Money, you know, CNBC came on. But, and she was, you know, she was like, I'm going to invest in, she had her small pension, but, and she got into biotech stocks. And by the time she retired, you know, she'd lost a third of her income. And that to me was part and parcel of bigger shifts from the defined benefit pension to the defined contribution, the 401k, which is about, it's less about community. It's more about individualism. It's like, you know, we're going to all do it alone. Um, that's a bigger, I think, cultural shift, um, but, it's, but it's part of the same question. But I do think we're swinging back now. And I would point to the fact that it's not, I, I still think it's a little bit more talk than walk right now, but um, Larry Fink, who heads up, um, you know, the largest asset manager in the world has said, look, we need stakeholder capitalism. We need to think more about uh, the community. I think one of the big questions, and I'm, I'm trying to think a lot about this myself, is what is the metric? How do you, how, what, you know, what's the number? I think something that was so easy about shareholder capitalism is it's one number, you know. And, and um, to your point of localism, um, I, and I remember uh, back in the 50s and early 60s that um, uh, corporations or companies were were very local in many ways, and they were held morally responsible by the community. Uh, if they weren't good corporate citizens, they lost business. And people would not go would use them. The Rotary meeting or whatever, and if you were being horrible, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that gets to another area of the neoliberal model that we didn't really look at, but consolidation. You, you've, you've seen the big get bigger in almost every sector. So a lot of small businesses just aren't there anymore, or community-based businesses. I'm going to give you a chance to end on a high note. <laughs> um, so either, the book is really clear that we don't yet have a clear, complete articulation of what the new post-neoliberal world order will look like. My sense is it's probably going to be difficult to get there, but you make me optimistic. So do you have recommendations for our students who agree with your analysis of what's wrong with big food and what's wrong with consolidation and financialization? How to fix these problems? What's most important and where should they start? Mm, what a good question. Um, vote, for starters. Absolutely vote. Um, lobby your your elected officials to think about these topics it is really amazing what one person can do and let me let me give you an example and this is a, the person i'm going to mention is is you know a pretty spectacular person but still one person alice waters who's a chef in california um it was a big is a big fan of the book and she and i are actually going to be in conversation um in uh at the ft festival as well she, um, you know, she started uh, basically as a as a as a chef. She was a student in France and and became interested in in fresh food and and brought these ideas back to America and started this sort of movement towards local agriculture and local agriculture of that kind of high end farmers market. You know, it used to be something that all right maybe on the weekend if you you know you go you buy your fancy vegetables. But she has in California, and that's a unique state, um, I understand, she started to make this happen at scale. And what she did was she lobbied, uh, she started one school project where uh, all the fruits and vegetables that would be fed to this, this, this particular public school were grown locally in the school garden. She has now lobbied and gotten public money to expand that into the K through 12 system in California and in the University of California system. And so what this is doing is it's starting to cut out the big like middlemen companies like your Cisco um, food supply companies or some of the commodities trading companies. And it's really it's it's a it's a food mission, but it's an economic mission. And that's just one person you know, doing one thing slowly over time. So I feel like change is, is really possible. 
let me all remind you that books will be on sale in the lobby for just a few <laughs> minutes after this. And would you all join me in a huge round of applause for Rana Faruhar? Thank you.